There's a rabbi, as you'd imagine, I might start with that phrase. There's a rabbi and his wife, and there's one day when the rabbi decides to do a little cleaning around the house, and he comes across a box that he doesn't recognize, and doesn't touch it because his wife said to him, that's private, don't touch it, don't look in it, it's mine. But one day when his wife is out, his temptation grows, and he goes to the box and he opens it. What he sees inside are three eggs and a thousand dollars. He's puzzled, he closes the box carefully, and his wife comes home and sees that something was changed. And she says, you opened the box, didn't you? He said, I did. I'm sorry, but can you please explain the contents of the box to me? And his wife says, listen, every time you've given a bad sermon in your career, I put an egg in the box. And the rabbi says, that's fantastic. 25 years, only three eggs? She goes, let me finish. Every time I got a dozen, I sold them for a dollar. Now, my wife and I do collect about six eggs a day from our hen, but I don't think that's her plan to get rich. And I start with this light story because I'm going to go to a place that I hope will have the right modicum of discomfort and awakening and depth to stir something in us beyond just laughter. But sometimes we need the lightness, the lyricism to get us into a place of openness. And the story that I want to tell you is a story of Chelm. And Chelm, if you've heard of it, is a place in southeastern Poland. But for the Jewish people in Jewish folklore, Chelm is a mythic place. It's a fictitious town, a village, where people who aren't very wise live and make unwise decisions thinking that they're wise ones. So in most of the Chelm tales, you'll have people finding a problem as a society and they solve it with the most inane solutions. So here's the story that I'll tell you. It comes to, it comes to a moment in Chelm when the people of the community realize that a great king is coming to visit their little town and they gather together, you, you can imagine, to solve the problem, how are we going to honor the king? And somebody says, I have the idea, and everybody agrees with him instantly before they even hear the idea, the idea because that's what happens in Chelm. And he says, we're going to put a barrel in the town square, the largest barrel we can create, and we're going to fill it, not all of us, every single one of us, is going to take just one flask of wine and we're going to pour it into the barrel. When the king comes, he's going to open his, his, the spigot at the bottom of the spout and drink from the barrel of wine. Everybody loves the idea. And everybody goes away and what they do, they bring the barrel to the center of the town and they bring a ladder to the side of the barrel and every day you can see people going up and down the ladder bringing their flask of wine to the top pouring it in, going home until the day comes when the king is due to arrive and he comes to the town with all the fanfare and regalia that this town can afford. And the leaders of the town run with the beautifully handcrafted flask that they've created for the king, a goblet, and they pour the wine, they bring it to the king and he raises it to the lips and the eyes of all the community and suddenly he has a look of disdain, of disgust, of surprise and nobody can understand why he's so upset. And they say, your majesty, what's wrong with our wine? And he says, it's water. You see, everybody in the town had the same idea. Everybody thought, everybody's going to put wine. All I need to put is water and nobody's going to know. It won't matter. <laughs> you see, maybe if one person does that, no problem. Slightly watered down wine, you can't even tell the difference. But when a whole community decides that everybody else is going to do the water, or I should say, the wine pouring for them, and says, mine won't matter, my contribution doesn't matter, that's when the king stands drinking a glass or a goblet of water. And I tell you this story because I have a certain pain at what I realized, what I experienced in the last, in the recent months. As you may know, I was on a period of sabbatical and my wife and I had religious and interreligious meetings in Jerusalem and in Rome and in Lisbon and other parts of Europe. And what was painful, not just upsetting, but actually painful to us, was what we perceived as the lack of living Judaism in most of those places. 
where you came from and where I came from, the hubs of Jewish life, the places where Judaism thrived and flourished. I remember we were in Lisbon when we had Shabbos in a synagogue, but let me tell you something about Lisbon. In Portugal, Portugal used to be one of the Iberian Peninsula's hubs of Jewish life. Many of you, when you do your 23 and Me, will realize you came from Portugal. Your ancestry came from Spain, that region. Of course, Sephardic Jews, Sephardic is Spain. That's your descent. But now there are two to 3,000 people in, Jude in Portugal who self-identify as Jews. There are more seats in this sanctuary. And ask yourself why. And I'll give you the historical answer. The historical answer is because those who weren't forcibly converted by the Roman Catholic Church in their days, and those days lasted for nearly 400 years, have become too afraid to self-identify publicly as Jewish people. I remember going that night, we came in a taxi looking for the synagogue, but before we could arrive at the synagogue, we had to fill in an application online, who we were, imagine, imagine, before coming to VOS, having to fill out a form and send pictures of your passports so somebody can vet your authenticity so that they know that they're going to be safe in their precious tool. And after we got through the first stages of security, we were given an address, we got in the Lisbon's version of an Uber, just a th rolled R, it's the same thing. And we get to a place, we don't see a synagogue, and we look, we don't see a synagogue, we're checking, checking the address, and at one point we see a door to a nondescript apartment building opens up, and a man comes out and waves to us. We go into this apartment building, and he takes us up to the second floor, and on that second floor, he takes us up to a single apartment. And we open the door, there's a mezuzah on the door, we kiss the mezuzah, walk inside, and there is a tiny, beautiful synagogue. The synagogue, the sanctuary fits within my kitchen. It's that small. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't have a large kitchen. But what we experienced that night was so beautiful and so precious because the people there wanted to be there. There was some tension in the fact that they had to make a difference in their lives, a decision to be there. Judaism for them wasn't casual and it wasn't easy. And when we were in Spain, we went to so many places and looked for Judaism in that hub of Jewish history and learning and life. And all we found in most of the major places was maps that took us to Jewish quarters where there were signs that said, here stood a synagogue and here the Jews lived and here they congregated. And what we found was merely signs, but not Jewish life. And my wife will tell you, I walked around with tears in my eyes. And the security around these sites was shocking and distracting from what they were meant to be. And I remember once when we were in southern Sicily, a place that we adore, and we were going to be there around Passover and during the Passover period. And I contacted a rabbi because I wanted to find a Seder so we wouldn't do Seder on our own, but instead find a Sicilian Seder. Imagine the food. And I contacted the rabbi, and the rabbi sent me a note. He said, Rabbi, I'm so sorry, but I no longer live in Sicily. There weren't enough Jews on the island of Sicily, which used to be a hub of Jewish life in Europe, to sustain even a small synagogue. I've moved back to Jerusalem. That was my reaction as well. There's a Jewish, a Yiddish phrase, schwer zu sein Yid. If you're Yiddish speakers, you know it means it's difficult being a Jew. But it isn't difficult for us to be Jewish here. For us, it's easy. For us, it's a choice. But there in Lisbon to show up in that synagogue was a challenging decision for every one of those people. I asked an older woman, this wonderful, sweet woman with whom I shared some old matzah because it was after Passover. And you know you show a commitment when you're still eating matzah after Passover. That's real Judaism, <laughs> digestive Judaism. And I asked her, do you have a mezuzah on your door? And she looked at me and she just smiled. No, she doesn't feel safe having a mezuzah on her door. You know, there was a Magid of Jerusalem. What's a Magid, a storyteller? Rabbi Schwadron, and Rabbi Schwadron was approached by one of his students. And one of his students says, Rabbi, I'm not going to be in class on Monday. I'm so sorry. And the rabbi says, why are you not going to be in class on Monday? And he says, because I have an important soccer game. And Rabbi Schwadron calls him over and he says, tell me, he says, tell me what this soccer is. 
And the young man says, well, soccer, you, what you do is there's a goal and you need to kick the ball into the goal. And the rabbi says, okay. He says, go now and kick the ball into the goal and come to class on Monday. <laughs> and the student says, rabbi, with all respect, you don't understand soccer. There has to be challenge, defenders, a goalie. He says, I understand. He says, come to class on Monday. When we talk about our Jewish life, we ask ourselves if we're living in Chelm, every one of us, if we should be adding wine or water to the barrel. What I want to say to you is we live in unique circumstances, a dot on the globe right here, where we can be so casual about our Jewish life, where we can see it as so easy, it's so simple. We fill out a form and we show up and we have this. But most of the world no longer has this because they've run in fear from it. I mentioned the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church historically has answers that are unanswerable in terms of what happened to the Jewish people as a result of what was said, purported by the church. But it would be irresponsible of me not to say that since the papacy of John the 23rd, the Roman Catholic Church has done a revolutionary shift. They've changed their doctrine in relation to the Jews. They've changed their liturgy in relation to the Jews. They have apologized publicly to the Jews. They've taken a pope to Jerusalem, to a synagogue, and to stand at the Western Wall. They have made amends with the Jewish people to say no more, no more. No longer will Jewish people be subjugated to any kind of abuse because of lies and because of the stories that we have propagated over millennia. So it'll take time for that to change, to change hearts and minds and actions. But we should be aware of what happened. I want to tell you something else. I want to talk about another church near and dear to my heart, and I hope to yours. That's this one. Just look around you for a second. Shepherd Church. It must be two decades already that we've been here. It must be two decades that they have embraced us that they've welcomed us, that in difficult times for our synagogue, like now, they have made this affordable so we could share our holidays with you. This church is unique. This circumstance of Judaism is unique. This circumstance of Christianity is unique. Let's recognize what's extraordinary and unique on the planet and in time about this moment that you're sitting in this sanctuary experiencing Rosh Hashanah. This isn't typical of the world. This is unique to the American story of Judaism and of Christianity and to these good-hearted, loving, sincere people. Ask yourself, though, what it means to stand with a flask in your hand as a Jewish person in the year 2022, the year 5,783 that we've just begun, and ask yourself what you are going to decide to put inside that glass, in the flask, because no one will know. It'll be silent and secret and invisible to everyone. You go up and you'll climb the ladder in this next year and you'll put in your finest wine just as the sacrifices in Jerusalem were made with the finest of all that we had. Or we'll put in water hoping that the others will take care of it for us. The Jewish present and future rely not on them and not on them and not on them but on us, on all of us. The Jewish future relies on us showing the beauty of Judaism to our children and our grandchildren. Inviting them to our holiday tables and to our holiday experiences and celebrations. Making a commitment to them, no matter what it takes to say, we will give you Jewish camps and Jewish school and Jewish bar mitzvahs and Jewish weddings if you'll let us. And it means seeing every one of us ourselves as ambassadors for something as precious as this. It's challenging being Jewish. Not because we live in a time and an age on the planet when it's challenging for us, but precisely because we don't. Precisely because it's so easy. Because we can be so casual about our Judaism. Decide if to go to work or if to go to synagogue, if to belong or not to belong, if to light a candle or not, if to perpetuate what we were handed, if to take the Torah from behind us and pass it along to the future or to leave it in a box in our past and in our rear view. I look to Judaism for the greatest source of wisdom, of personal growth, 
of psychological repair, of communal growth, of societal repair that I have found anywhere in my life. And what I see in it is ways to improve ourselves every single day. We have a guidebook in a scroll to human character. And remember the rabbis looked at all of those commandments that we might say, what do they mean in our lives today? In the year 2022, we say, how do they have relevance? What do these tzitzit, these fringes mean in an age of iPhones and Apple and Android and all that we have and all that we have as the tools in our lives? And yet here was this toolbox handed to us thousands and thousands of years ago that has sustained us in every family and every, every generation of this Jewish collective story. What we see is a community, and when I look out here, I have this incredible vantage point, as do they, of seeing you. And I see relationships, precious, precious people, and relationships, and people who share a story, people who stand next to each other and hold each other in prayer, people who find each other in moments of simcha and in moments of sorrow. People who say, regardless of everything that's going on in that vast and troubling and volatile world, we're going to find stability, not through an ark and not through a sanctuary, but through each other. It's challenging, but infinitely rewarding. A relationship with God is challenging, but infinitely rewarding. Coming here, finding each other on a Shabbos or a Yom Tov is challenging, but infinitely rewarding. Showing up for each other, learning the wisdom of our history and our stories is challenging but infinitely rewarding. And what you do by being here, and I don't mean just on this morning, what you do even via live stream, you who can't be here in person now, is you make the decision, which is a glorious, beautiful decision, to say let's reach for the best wine in our home. And let's uncork it and let's pour something for the Jewish people. We're meant to be, and I believe we have been, for countless generations, a light unto the nations. That's written in the book of Isaiah. That light can't go out. It's going out in parts of Europe. It's shrinking and hiding. People are not willing to put a menorah in their window as you and I might be. They're not willing to light a menorah in a park or in a mall as we are. They're not willing to wear a chai or a magen david star as we are. They're not willing to wear a yarmulke or a tzitzit, a talit in the street as we are. So we have to realize and we have to recognize the importance of us. There was a reading last night or this morning that talked about the individual. And the individual only matters when we come out of our doors and find each other, when we add our light to the light of each other. I don't know, as you don't know, what our investments will yield in the coming year. Stocks, bonds, real estate, no idea. But what I do know is that if we lean into our Jewish selves and our Jewish learning and our Jewish lives and our Jewish community, the rewards will be vast and beautiful and precious and necessary in this moment of the human story. Shana Tovah.